Okay, thank you very much. My name is Eli. I'm from the International Rail Wonder Foundation. And David invited me. I want to thank him and thank everybody here for giving me the opportunity to give you today a present. Everybody understands me? Clear? Yes. A present that I hope will be so dear to you that you will not want to keep this present for yourself. You want to give it to other people. You want to transfer it and maybe also help me to give it to other people as well. So again, before we start, thank you. If we came into this room and this room was completely dark, what would we do? Turn on the light. In other words, everybody here agrees with, what's your name? Or there, who said that when you go into a dark room, automatically you look for the light, right? In the same way, we are now going to go into the darkest period of our history. When you go into the darkest period of our history, we also turn on the light. But if we don't turn on the light when we go into the darkest period of our history, we remain in the dark. Just like if you don't turn on the light when you come into the room, you remain in the dark. So what we're going to do today, we're going to go into the darkest period of our history. But unlike what you've done before, we're going to try and put on the light. To everybody here, a present of light. A present of light and love. The present of Raoul Wallenberg. And again, thank you. Raoul grew up to be a very sensitive child. When he finished his studies, his grandfather, Gustav, came to speak to him. Raoul, you finished your studies now, and I've got great plans for you. I'd like you to be an international banker, to come into the family business. But first of all, I'd like you to get experience. I'd like you to become a citizen of the world to get to know other peoples, other cultures. What do you say, Raoul? I've got a friend in Haifa, in Palestine. He's got a Dutch bank. What do you say? You'll go there, you work in the bank, you live with a Jewish family, and you'll get some experience. Okay, Grandpa. 1936, Raoul Wallenberg comes to the land of Israel, Palestine at the time. He lives in Haifa with a Jewish family, and he works in a Dutch bank. One day, the mother of the house, speaks to him. Roll, there's a boat coming in from Germany. You know, refugees. Maybe somebody will need a room. So you may have a guest this evening. Welcome. That night, Roll comes back to his room, and there's a boy there called Ariel, who just came to the land of Israel from Germany. He just landed in Haifa. And between them starts a discussion. Tell me, Ariel, what's going on in Germany? What, you don't know, Raul? They don't you humiliate us. They don't let us work. They throw us out of our jobs. It's impossible to live in Germany today. And Raul hears what's happening to the Jews in Germany in 1936, three years after Hitler came to power. After he hears the details, he has one question. But one thing I don't understand, Ariel. What about your friends, your neighbours, the people who you are friendly with? What role? You don't know? Nobody cares about the Jews anymore. Nobody cares about us. Raoul could not hear that answer. What do you mean nobody cares about you? The whole night he couldn't sleep. He had this discussion with God. I care about these people. They're human beings like you and me. He writes a letter to his grandfather. I don't know if I want to be a banker, Granddad. I want to help people. I want to help these people. When he goes back to Sweden, a young girl, 17 years old, remembers. She was 17 at the time, Vivka Lindfors, later to be a Hollywood actress. I went out with him on a date. You never believe what a date I had. The whole date, you know, a date, you have a good fun, you have a child. The whole date, you're supposed to be out one thing. The suffering of the Jews. It's all crazy. I'm going out with a young Swede on a date. And instead of having fun, all he talks about is the suffering of the Jews. It's his own personal suffering. 
I thought something was wrong with him. He spoke so intensively. Only years later, when I heard what he'd done, I realized how true he was and how superficial and young I was at the time. Raoul Wallenberg has a dream to help the Jewish people. I have to cut the story a bit short. January 1944. Close to five million Jews have already been killed. A man in the Treasury Department of the United States Treasury writes a document. The acquiescence, the agreement of this government in the murder of the Jews. His name was Josiah Dubois. He takes this document to his boss, the Minister of Finance of the United States government, Henry Morgenthau. This is the document. You have to go to see the President. You have to bang on the table of the White House and demand actions of, to save the Jews. If not, I will take this document and I will go to the press and I will divulge how the American government and the State Department are obstructing rescue operations when it is possible to save tens of thousands of Jews. January 1944, Henry Morgenthau, the only Jew in the United States government, finally goes to the Oval Office and has a meeting with the President, Roosevelt. Morgenthau, do you realize what this document says? I can no longer mince my words, Mr. President. We have to act now. We have done everything to obstruct the saving of the Jews. We have to act. After a heated discussion, the President decides on the creation of the American War Refugee Board. That board will have the responsibility of trying to save a few thousand Jews through diplomatic means. Ivor Olson of the CIA, they called it at the time OSS, will be sent by the President to Sweden to look for a man who will go to Hungary and try to save the last Jews. In Sweden he meets Ambassador Johnson, the American ambassador, and Rabbi Aaron Price, the chief rabbi of Sweden. And they look for the man who is going to go and save the last Jews. Raoul Wallenberg volunteers, and he comes for the interview. Raoul Wallenberg, yeah, no, 31, no real experience. Why do you think that you can save the Jews? It's very simple. I wrote to you my conditions. If you allow me to go, nothing will stop me. Just read my nine conditions. Accept that and I'll do everything. Conditions, Valaga? You write here, you want to go and have a free hand to do whatever you like without asking permission. You want to be able to bribe, bribe Rana? Have Jews live in a Swedish embassy? Threaten? One of them, you're asking a free hand, what we call a green light, to do whatever you want. Tell me one of them, do you know many diplomats who can do whatever they want without asking permission? who have a green light to do everything? How many diplomats do you know who can do what they want? Threaten? Bribe? Put Jews in Swedish embassy? Don't you understand? Well, you still don't understand? Millions have been killed already. I can't play by the rules. If I ask permission, there'll be nobody to save. There'll be no one left. Tell me, does anybody limit the Nazis? You can't limit me. Who is this man who speaks in another language? Who is this man, Raoul Wallenberg, 
who says he wants to go and save Jews, but he refuses to ask permission for his rescue methods. Who is he? Where does he come from? What does he have in his heart that a lot of people at that time simply didn't have? What did he have? What made him so different? In the 1960s, an American singer used to sing, How many ears must one man have in order to hear people cry? How many ears must one man have in order to hear people cry? The answer, my friends, is blowing in the wings. What is the answer that is blowing in the wings? What enables you to hear somebody cry 3,000 kilometers from here and you can't even hear somebody cry in the next room? What enables you to hear people cry 3,000 kilometers away? Well, one of them knew the answer. Do I need permission to save my family? One of them? But you're not Jewish. Why do you call them your family? They're not your family. Oh, yes, they are. My great-great-grandfather was Jewish. I'm half Jewish. But the real reason that they're my family is because I read twice, twice, the book of Adolf Hitler. Why should somebody want to read twice the book of a person who hates of Adolf Hitler? Why? What does he write in the book? That he is serving humanity? That he is solving the Jewish problem? If he is serving humanity by solving the Jewish problem and we do not consider the Jews as our family, that means he's right, no? Isn't that? Well, Wallenberg reads Adolf Hitler and understands that Adolf Hitler is not just saying, I hate. He is also saying, I hate. But do you love? Well, one of them understood Hitler in a much deeper way than any professor, than any university doctorate. He understood the meaning of what Adolf Hitler wrote. In July 1944, Raoul Wallenberg comes to Budapest. The American president and the king of Sweden had agreed to his terms. When he arrives in Budapest, he's received by Ambassador Danielson, the Swedish ambassador. Oh, Wallenberg, how was your trip? You know, a lot of work here, Wallenberg. Tell me, how do you intend to say to Jews? Do you have a plan? Not really. But I did bring with me my secret weapon. Secret, secret weapon, Wallenberg? And what might may that be, may I ask? Secret weapon, that's interesting. Nothing dramatic. Just my imagination. 